So are we then back to the polity situation that existed in 1977, before there was a definitive guidance approved by the General Assembly? I think so. Because there was no, no reference to any kind of sexual right. activity uh, back in the form of government under which I was ordained. Right, right. And, and absolutely, that's such a great question. And for me, um, it, it was the General Assembly in San Jose in 2008, uh, which, which removed uh, those authoritative interpretations and the old defensive guidance of 78. And, and that teaching... For those of you who are heterosexual, and I know that some of you are, some of my best friends are heterosexual. Um, I want you to imagine for a minute, would you have been part of the Presbyterian Church if the teaching had been this? Heterosexuality is sinful, incompatible with service in the church, and heterosexuality is not part of God's design. Would you be part of that kind of teaching and that kind of organization. Many of my straight friends or allies say, I don't know how you stay, have stayed in as long as you have. And what we know is that we lost many gay and lesbian persons to the United Church of Christ, to other places, who had gifts, who were qualified, who said, I can't work in this kind of hostile environment. It was interesting to me today, driving from Hartford, Connecticut here, and listening to NPR, and General Amos who's in charge of the Marines, was talking about don't ask, don't tell. Um, and, and he said, you know, it's the law now, and this is what we support. And I thought, wow, I wish that was true for the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> <laughs> um, but removing this teaching that homosexuality is sinful, incompatible with service in the church, and not part of God's design in 2008, to me, is huge. And it takes a burden off people. Imagine our young people growing up with that kind of teaching. Uh, imagine if we're talking about bullying in schools and teenage suicide, and our church still holds that teaching. So for me, uh, this is a remarkable, liberating moment uh, for our, our life together and what we teach people who they are uh, in God's image. This also doesn't, I'm not trying to suggest that people can't individually hold that, that they think homosexuality is a sin. Uh, and that's how they read scripture, and they've had a bad experience with a gay person, or whatever it is that has have they, they've come to that conclusion. They can still hold that individual opinion or belief. And there may be persons in this room uh, who respectfully disagree with me in that regard. Um, but our church doesn't teach that anymore. That's not our official position. Um, so for me, that's that's huge. Go ahead. Uh, I have uh, a, a two questions, and in order to ask them, I need to put it in a context. Uh, I'm a retired Presbyterian minister, and about uh, three, four weeks ago, I officiated at a wedding uh, of uh, a family that had grown up in the church that I had uh, served. And present was an, an elder who had been a member of that congregation also. So after the wedding, and, in, and the wedding, uh, it was a heterosexual wedding, and I used the liturgy, which is a part of the Presbyterian Church's uh, uh, liturgy for marriage. So a couple days later, I was having dinner with the elder, and in the course of our conversation, she said, um, I was listening to the, the service as you went through it, and I was thinking about a young man who both of us knew who grew up in the church that I had served in, which he was an elder, who was who was gay. And she said, I was listening to that, and I was feeling if he were here listening to that service, he would feel excluded mm -hmm. from what is being said mm -hmm. in, in the service. And I had not thought about it that way. So I went back, I reread it, tried to look at it through those eyes to see, you know, how it sounded from that perspective. So I have two questions. The first question is, my understanding is that Presbyterian ministers currently cannot officiate at a same-sex marriage, but at a civil union? That's the first question. And the second one is, how, how could the liturgy be re 
reshape to make it more inclusive? I think as a moderator, I'm going to do this because we have two experts on the marriage issue coming right along. And so I think it will be easier to answer those questions in that context okay. than to do it in this order. Mm -hmm. But those are very good, important questions. I just wanted to return to this previous subject. Um, Jim asked what is <coughs> different now than prior to 1978. On the one hand, I think uh, we're back into the era where character and uh, qualifications are the determination of the local congregation. But prior to 78, and even after 78, it was pretty much a don't ask, don't tell, don't talk about it. And the huge difference now is that congregations or, and have been empowered to examine gay men and women for their calling to serve as elders and to talk about it. And that's a big change. Mm -hmm. It's a huge change. And if, um, I imagine you're aware, uh, and when we when we think about officers, what I know is that when we think about ordination equality, we think of ministers, uh, now called teaching elders. <laughs> Imagine trying to explain this to the press. Um, I mean, really. Um, I know Ralph loves all of this, but I'm sort of like, oh my God, you know, you should have my job trying to translate the Presbyterian Church and changes in policies, you know, and like as a minister, a pastor, and then there's a teaching elder, and I'm like, oh my God, their hair is spinning. Their hair is on fire. Um, but I love what you say because we know, you know, for me, the call to serve as deacon or elder, ruling elder, uh, are equally as important uh, as the call to what we used to say, minister of the word and sacrament, now teaching elder. Uh, Scott Anderson uh, was ordained uh, on October 8th. Uh, he serves as the executive director of the uh, Wisconsin Council of Churches, and it was a remarkable, happy moment. Uh, and uh, there were several ovations uh, and so much joy at that service. Um, Scott had been ordained, as many of you know, his narrative, his history, 20-something um, years ago. Uh, but because he was a quiet gay person, um, uh, he was threatened uh, by people in the congregation that said, we're going to out you. So he, he demitted, he gave up his ordination. Um, and several years ago, made a decision to become, if you will, ordained again. Um, so he is actually the first openly gay person to be ordained since the passage of 10A on May 10th. Um, and it, it's going into effect on July uh, 10th. Uh, the second was just this past Sunday, uh, Scott Clark. I'm sort of thinking the next person can't be named Scott. <laughs> uh, but Scott uh, was ordained uh, in California. He serves at San Francisco Theological. Uh, as chaplain and student services. Uh, his first career was as an attorney. Um, but those are joyous moments. But what we know is that our church has been ordaining gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender people fr from the very beginning. Uh, and so I love that you describe now congregations are talking about that more and there's a spirit of openness. So that's really important for us to be in the conversation it is both life-giving and could be life-saving uh, to break the silence.